well, welcome everyone. Uh, we, we thank you for, for coming for uh, what is a really terrific event. Um, my name is Rick Ozzie Nelson. I'm the director of the <laughs> Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program here at CSIS. Uh, and we're absolutely honored and uh, privileged to have uh, Secretary Napolitano here to talk about um, securing the border, the smarter law enforcement approach. Uh, I'd first like to thank the sponsor of the Statesman's Forum, which is the uh, Luventadis Group, um, who has, has supported the Statesman's Forum through, throughout, uh, throughout the year, and we appreciate that. Uh, obviously, a lot has been going on in the world of border security, particularly in the southwest uh, so, uh, border area. And obviously, as the former governor of Arizona and now the Secretary of Homeland Security, we have, uh, you know, obviously a very, very unique and perspective on this. And uh, it'll be certainly a learning event for all of us. How we'll move forward, um, Secretary DiPolitano is going to give her remarks first. I'm not going to go through a lengthy introduction because we do have a tight timeline. Uh, when she's done with her remarks, uh, she'll return to her seat, and then we'll go into questions and answers directly for the panel. I will be the moderator. I'm going to run a tight ship. It'll be questions and answers. There will be no statements and answers. Um, so if, uh, if that upsets anybody, I, I apologize in advance for that, but we're on a short timeline. So with, uh, with no, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Secretary Napolitano. Thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you, and, and it is a, a pleasure to be here, and, and thank you to the Major City Chiefs Association and, and the CSIS for hosting uh, this event today. Uh, uh, one addition I, I think uh, I would make uh, to the program is that uh, after I sit down and before questions, I think we'll introduce the other uh, panelists um, who uh, come from a, uh, really the direct hands-on uh, frontline uh, responsibilities in the in the areas that I'm going to speak about. I want to uh, especially thank John Morton, uh, the Assistant Secretary for ICE, and uh, David Aguilar from CBP. Uh, they are here today, as well as uh, the Director of National uh, Drug Control Policy, Gil Kerlikowski, uh, who is expert in this area and a very effective advocate for smart and effective law enforcement. Uh, thank you, Gil. Um, uh, and I'm also happy to welcome Rob Davis, a president of the Major City Chiefs Association, a great community leader in the city of San Jose, uh, really doing some important and novel things uh, with the police department there. Uh, indeed, the Major City Chiefs Association has been a great partner with the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we're proud to be able to support the 56 big city police chiefs that you represent and to support the more than 800,000 sworn officers uh, that are uh, present in those departments. So uh, thank you, Chief. Um, uh, before I open uh, it up for uh, discussion, uh, I'd like to speak about some of the immigration and border-related challenges that law enforcement faces. Um, first, uh, let me begin by saying that border security and enforcement is primarily the responsibility of the federal government. And unfortunately, uh, for decades, we have not had an effective strategy that is border-wide. Uh, we've not devoted the attention, personnel, and resources that have been required to cover the border all the way from Brownsville to San Diego. Now, from day one, the Obama administration has taken its responsibility here seriously and has developed and implemented a clear strategy to obtain that personnel, those resources, that equipment and technology that's truly required for the federal government to meet its responsibility along our nation's border. So today I want to discuss our strategy and the strong and smart measures that DHS has already taken to improve enforcement, both at the border and within the interior of the country. I'd like to detail what progress we've made and the next steps that we are taking. Now let's begin with the current challenges. Our southwest border states have endured more than their share of challenges. And I know this from personal experience, having worked directly on border issues since 1993, first as the United States Attorney for Arizona, then as the Arizona Attorney General, uh, then as the Governor of Arizona, and now, of course, as Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, I was actually raised in another border state, New Mexico. So I have spent almost all of my life along that southwest border. I have walked it. I have driven it. I have flown it. I have even ridden it on horseback. 
Uh, this is a border that I know extremely well. And I share uh, the frustration that border communities feel about the challenges that exist in that region, as shown by the cartel-related violence in Mexico and the tragic murder of Rob Krentz in Cochise County, County, Arizona, just a few months ago. You do not need to live along the border to feel that frustration. All across the country, in every region, every city and town, Americans want the federal government doing everything it can to secure our borders and to enforce our immigration laws smartly and effectively. No one is happy with the status quo. I'm certainly not, and neither is the President. But as someone who has seen and heard just about every idea, slogan, and political theory about the border and immigration enforcement over the past 20 years, I can tell you that this administration has pursued a broad new enforcement and security strategy with a greater urgency and care than anything I have seen since I began my career in public service. And the strategy is showing real progress. Uh, let me point to a few reasons why. First, we have dispensed with the rhetoric and we've just gotten to work. Now, for too long, we heard bumper sticker slogans about being tough. Uh, but looking tough just doesn't get the job done. We decided that we needed to add some smarts to toughness and to make some changes to build a coordinated and comprehensive strategy that included CBP, ICE, the Department of Justice family, and our state and local partners. The statistics today reflect that this approach is working, and I'll get to a few of those in a minute. But second, and most important reason we are seeing progress is because of the men and women working on the front line each day, and I'd like to pause on this for just a moment. We know that law enforcement in border states and throughout the country faces a tall order when it comes to border-related crime and smuggling. The men and women who wear a badge and put themselves in harm's way each day do it because they, like each of us, want to do the right thing for our country and they want to make a real difference. We count on them for this and they perform their duties with a professionalism and skill that goes above and beyond every single day. They depend on us for our support and for a tough and smart federal enforcement strategy. We owe them nothing less. We are giving them nothing less, and I will continue to do so as long as the President and I and everyone else on this dais hold these positions. We also know there are thousands and thousands of businesses around the country that are trying to follow the law and hire a legal workforce. These are small businesses, farmers, food growers, producers, and ranchers that are the backbone of our economy. They, like our men and women in law enforcement, must have our full support. They deserve nothing less than a regime that cracks down swiftly on businesses that knowingly hire illegal workers to gain an unfair workplace advantage. To our partners in the business community who are doing the right thing, I say we are with you. The government has stepped up our efforts through I-9 audits and intelligent workplace enforcement to level the playing field. We will not yield in this arena because we all have a role to play. Businesses have a role. State and local law enforcement have a role. And of course, as I started out, the biggest responsibility rests with the federal government. It's the responsibility we take seriously. It's why we've taken the steps we have already taken. And it's why we are committed to doing even more and are constantly looking for ways to improve our federal enforcement policy. So let me start with a status update on the smart, effective approach we've been taking over the past 18 months. The personnel we've deployed, the technology and resources we've invested, the states we are helping through better information sharing and increased grant funding, it's a very different picture now than it was before. Now, 
you might not get this impression from those looking to score political points by saying uh, that border and immigration enforcement are spinning out of control. Um, and I say the numbers tell the story and they do not lie. The Border Patrol is better staffed and more strategically deployed today than ever before. Since 2004, the number of agents has risen. It's actually doubled from about 10,000 to 20,000 today, actually a little more than 20,000. We've deployed more U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement personnel than ever before to work strategically on investigations, intelligence, and interagency task forces to combat smuggling and human trafficking. We've also deployed more technology than ever to detect smugglers and their cargo. More airplanes, more helicopters, more unmanned aerial vehicles are working the border than ever before. And for the first time, DHS is screening 100 percent of southbound rail shipments for illegal weapons, drugs, and cash. In terms of infrastructure, the 652 miles of fencing that Congress asked Homeland Security to build is nearly complete. The remaining six miles are expected by the end of the year. The federal government is also collaborating with state and local law enforcement along the border more closely than ever before. And recognize I was in state and local law enforcement before I moved to Washington, D.C. a year and a half ago. We are leveraging the resources and capabilities of over 50 law enforcement agencies to deter, deny, and disrupt transnational criminal organizations. And we've increased the funding for state and local law enforcement that, that they can use to combat border-related crime through Operation Stone Garden. On top of all of this, the administration has partnered with the government of Mexico in ways that are simply unprecedented. We're conducting more operations together, sharing more information, and putting pressure on the Mexican drug trafficking organizations that run smuggling operations into virtually every community in the United States. These efforts have produced results. Apprehensions of illegal crossers, uh, the best indication of how many are crossing, are at a fraction of their all-time high. They were down 23 percent last year from the year before. Last year, seizures of cartel-related contraband rose significantly across the board. We seized 14 percent more illegal bulk cash, 29 percent more illegal weapons, and 15 percent more illegal drugs than the year before. And these kinds of numbers tell the story about our strategy. We are focusing our energy on the most dangerous threats to communities. So the numbers of apprehensions and removals are beginning to reflect this strategy. In short, we are doing a number of things, and we are also removing a record number of criminals from our country. By all measurable standards, crime levels in United States border towns have actually remained flat or have dropped. Uh, we've also made important changes to the way that we conduct interior enforcement. We're doing it in a way that is smarter and more effective than before. We've strengthened oversight across the board, fostering consistency in immigration enforcement and clearly prioritizing enforcement against convicted criminal aliens who pose the most danger to our communities. Uh, we've expanded the Secure Communities Program, which uses biometric information to identify and remove criminal aliens in state prisons and local jails. Since it began in October of 2008, it has identified almost 35,000 aliens charged with or convicted of the most serious violent or major drug offenses. Over 8,500 of the most serious convicted criminal aliens have been removed from the United States through secure communities. We've changed the way, as I mentioned, we approach worksite enforcement, moving away from raids that emphasize the number of workers arrested and focusing instead on the employers who exploit undocumented workers or commit criminal offenses. Already this year, we have arrested more than 100 employers. We've refocused our fugitive operations, prioritizing criminal fugitives. As a result, whereas in fiscal year 2008, 
Only a quarter of all fugitives arrested were convicted criminals in fiscal year 2010, more than or much closer to one half of the fugitives arrested are convicted criminals. We have also expanded E-Verify, which continues to grow by roughly 1,000 employers each week. We have made it more accurate, cracking down on identity fraud and abuse. Our goal for this system is that it be effective, convenient for employers, and accurate, so that employers have a reliable system and those who are here legally won't be inconvenienced or denied a job because of flawed or incorrect data. So in addition to the positive results we've achieved from our border security strategy, our interior enforcement efforts have also shown positive results. So far this year, ICE has removed more than 117,000 aliens convicted of crimes, 37% more than during the same time frame last year. Indeed, of all the aliens removed so far in fiscal year 2010, as I said before, half are convicted criminals. And in fiscal year 2009, ICE conducted more than 1,400 I-9 audits of employers suspected of hiring illegal labor triple the number as the previous year. So while we've taken unprecedented actions to increase border security and improve interior enforcement, we are not satisfied. There is more work to do. That is why, and that's what I'd like to move to now, the new measures that we need to take. It's why President Obama has recently requested $500 million more to bolster law enforcement and security along the southwest border and will deploy 1,200 National Guard troops to assist the ongoing efforts to secure the border and combat the cartels. These are common sense measures to strengthen and expand efforts that have already proven successful. And today, I'd like to announce several new steps in our enforcement efforts. The first is a new partnership with the Major City Chiefs Association to create a Southwest Border Law Enforcement Compact. This will boost law enforcement at the border by creating a mechanism, a way for state and local law enforcement agencies that aren't on the border to detail officers to state and local law enforcement agencies who are on the border. We're also creating a system that will fully interlink the information systems of all state, local, and tribal law enforcement entities operating along the southwest border with those of DHS and of DOJ. This will make sure that officers on the front line have the best information we can give them and that they can share what they learn back up the chain. We're also establishing a Suspicious Activities Reporting, or SARS, program for the southwest border. This will help local officers recognize and track incidents related to criminal activity by drug traffickers and utilize this information for targeted law enforcement operations on both sides of the border. Next. We're strengthening the analytic capability of the state and major urban area fusion centers along the southwest border so that they are better able to receive and share threat information, improving our ability to recognize and mitigate emerging threats. Next, we're partnering with the Office of National Drug Control Policy to implement Project Roadrunner, an automated license plate recognition system. Project Roadrunner was conceived to target both north and southbound drug trafficking and associated illegal activity along the southwest border. We're focusing on money laundering and bulk cash smuggling operations in transportation corridors along the southwest border and targeting hot spots through roadside interdiction surges. For that region, uh, I have now ordered the deployment of additional Border Patrol agents, ICE investigators, air assets, and other technologies to the Arizona border to conduct targeted operations against the cartels that exploit this part of the border, specifically around the Tucson sector. We're also expanding the illegal drug program to additional southwest uh, border ports of entry 
So drug traffickers whose trafficking activity can be tied to Mexico are returned to Mexico to face prosecution by Mexican authorities. We're also expanding the Joint Criminal Alien Removal Task Forces. These are comprised of ICE agents and local law enforcement, and they identify and arrest convicted criminal aliens who are living in our communities. Uh, now this also involves deploying surge teams to work with state and local jails that are within 100 miles of the southwest border to ensure the identification of all removable convicted criminal aliens detained in those jails who, if released, would pose a danger to public safety. I'm also proud to announce today that the Federal Aviation Administration has approved the use of CBP unmanned aircraft system flights along the Texas border and in the Gulf region. CBP plans to base an unmanned aircraft system, or UAS, at the Corpus Christi Naval Air Station as soon as all necessary arrangements are finalized to sustain a permanent UAS presence there. These types of flights aren't useful everywhere, but in some places they're part of the right mix of infrastructure, manpower, and technology that improves border security. This is the case for parts of the Texas border, and we plan to move forward with using this technology there. And finally, we're increasing joint training programs with Mexican law enforcement, focusing on money laundering organizations, uh, investigations, and human trafficking and exploitation organizations. I'd like to conclude on a part, on a, on a point that I think bears repeating. There is a clear federal responsibility here. And this administration has taken this responsibility serious from the very start. We're attacking the challenges the border brings, and we're doing so in ways that are smart and tough and strategic. The policies and resources we have put in place at the border and in the interior constitute the most serious and thorough immigration and border-related effort ever. There is no magic bullet here but we are addressing the problem in ways that are smart and unprecedented. Now, securing our border requires constant pressure, and maximizing our efforts, especially against traffickers and criminals, will require more than just federal, state, and local resources. It will also require Congress working across party lines to enact changes to our immigration laws so that we have a comprehensive set of reforms that meet the needs of our country. And this administration is committed to taking that step. It's not just enough to address just one part of our broken immigration system without addressing the rest. For too long, all we've heard in this debate is tough talk without the smart, comprehensive steps we need to truly fix the immigration system. The immigration debate is about accountability. It's about meeting fundamental responsibilities. And as I mentioned earlier, the federal government needs to meet its responsibility to secure our borders. Employers who gain the system and hire undocumented workers need to be held accountable. And yes, illegal immigrants also need to be held accountable by requiring them to register, get right with the law, pay their taxes, learn English, before they can ever get in line to earn American citizenship. Each of these components is related, and that's why we need a single functional immigration and border policy. We cannot have 50 different state policies. It simply will not work. Now, too often, politicians' bumper sticker slogans are, are presented as real solutions. They are not. The American public knows better and can be assured that this administration and the Department of Homeland Security will continue to take every action needed to secure the border and pursue real immigration reform. And with that, and with that assurance, I'm happy to open up the floor along with Assistant Secretary Morton, Deputy Commissioner Aguilar, Director Kurlikowski, Major Cities Chief President Rob Davis, to talk about this subject of such importance to the American people. Thank you very much.
Madam Secretary, thank you very much for those uh, uh, very, very good remarks, and we appreciate the update on uh, all the new initiatives and all the accomplishments. I think sometimes it gets lost in, in the media. Um, we focus on all the negatives. We forget how much progress we have made and how good uh, our forces in the field are doing on a daily basis, and I think that that was an excellent job of highlighting that. Um, uh, you've already introduced the panel. I'll just go through them very qu quickly here just to point out some of their highlights, but next to you, you have uh, Director uh, Kier Lukowski, who's the director of the Office of uh, uh, National Drug Control Policy in the nation's sixth uh, drug jar. In his position, he coordinates all federal aspects of the federal drug control programs and implementations of the president's uh, national drug control strategy. He has 37 years of law enforcement experience, and prior to this, he was the chief of police in Seattle for, uh, for eight years. Uh, next, we have Assistant Secretary uh, uh, John Morton. Uh, he leads the principal investigative opponent, uh, component for DHS and also the second largest investigative component in the U.S. government. Um, he's a, a career attorney, DOJ experience in government service for, for many years. Then we have Deputy Commissioner Aguilar, um, a career uh, border security uh, 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 officer for 30 years um, and now uh, is the uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Customs and Border Patrol. And then lastly, we're very, it's actually one of the honors we have here is uh, Chief Davis, who is the Chief of Police of San Jose, California and President of the Major City Chiefs Association, flew in on the red eye today uh, to be with us uh, and he's been with the police force there since 1980. Um, so we're, we're actually really privileged to have him here as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the prerogative of opening up the first question, and I, I want to tap into some of the, the local law enforcement experience we have at the table here and ask a question about information sharing. We, we talk a lot about information sharing at the federal government level and how difficult and challenging it is. Um, although federal information sharing between state and local and the federal government is probably going to be infinitely more difficult and infinitely more challenging. And particularly when we look at the southwest border, where you have multiple jurisdictions, including tribal elements and Mexican government and the federal government, the challenges of, of getting the right information to the right people are, are significant. So I'd like to ask um, um, uh, uh, Director Kierkowski and uh, Chief Davis to get your thoughts on what are some of the challenges of getting the information that you need to do your jobs there, um, um, and, and how are we overcoming those as, as a government? I'll start with you, Chief Davis. Oh, thanks. When we discuss the issue of sharing information, clearly uh, from our perspective of major city chiefs, it's about relationships. You know, in terms of sharing information, criminal information across platforms, be it state, local, whatever the case may be, we have had partners in the past. We've seen the FBI and others that have brick and mortar presence in our communities, and we have relationships with them. DHS, you know, has been around for coming up on a decade. We're still in the process of establishing those relationships. But make no mistake, there's been a huge amount of effort and a lot of success that's transpired over the last several years as we have begun to create fusion centers and other mechanisms whereby local law enforcement can get together and begin to have a face-to-face -face contact with our state and federal com uh, partners. So that's the key there. We, and the other, the other problem, I think, for us, and I'll conclude on this, is that you look across the country, and in California in particular, we're cutting services, we're cutting patrol officers. I'm standing to lose about 8% of my workforce in the next month here. So when you're trying to figure out where you're going to prioritize what you're doing, we really do have to get savvy and figure out how we can share information, uh, take advantage of each other's resources. It's going to be key to success in the future as we're dealing with dwindling budgets. So to the extent that local law enforcement can have that support from the federal government to try and make sure that we're standing up the fusion centers and have those face-to-face -face relationships, that's where we need to be going. Director Kierlowski. You mentioned my 37 years. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, a, a couple things that I think are important. Rob mentioned fusion centers. The other, uh, I think, hallmark of this administration in particular is to select people that have the backgrounds at the state level and at the local level. Uh, after 9-11, uh, information sharing began to improve markedly, but I think that we've taken it a few steps further. And that is looking at this problem, especially the drug problem, quite holistically and not <laughs> looking at it as just the border being that uh, 1,960 miles along that area. It is involving everyone in this effort, whether it was the Seattle Police Department in this new law enforcement compact uh, uh, that the Secretary just mentioned. All of this is meant to, to supplement and, and, uh, and augment and work closely with the federal resources. And frankly, in that long experience, I have never seen better examples of, uh, of the sharing of information, all uh, in an effort to make sure that our communities are protected. 
Great. Thank you very much, both of you. Okay, we'll go ahead and open to, uh, for, for questions. It's a little bit difficult sometimes to see people with the lights, but uh, we'll go ahead and start with the gentleman in the blue suit right here. This town, everybody has a blue suit, huh? We have microphones coming around. Please state your name and where you're from uh, and direct your question, and then I'll kind of assign it to a panelist. Yes, my name is Gregorio Meraz, and I would like to uh, see if uh, Secretary Napolitano and Mr. Aguilar can tell us which is the current status of the investigations in regards with the shootings at the border, and how do you think that more deployment of troops and personnel can avoid uh, uh, interference with the good relationship that you have currently with the Mexican government? Uh, Gregorio, thank you for that uh, question, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. One of the things that I think that we need to recognize is, as has been stated numerous times before, that we ask our men and women to deploy in a very complex environment of the border. It is, a, uh, it is an environment that is uh, not only complex, but is a tough area. They encounter various uh, uh, activities that, until they encounter the activities, they don't know what they are uh, up against. That being said, any time that there is loss of life, it is very, very regrettable. The incident that you speak to is, in fact, being investigated. It is being investigated, looked into thoroughly, jointly with the law enforcement community throughout the area there. And once that is completed, we will put out the information uh, in a very open fashion. So the investigation is ongoing as we speak. As to the National Guard, the National Guard deployments that have worked throughout the last 20 years that we have worked with the National Guard has worked in a very, very uh, coordinated fashion to the point that it increases our capabilities in such a fashion that it puts more boots on the ground, more Border Patrol agent boots on the ground, support from the National Guard, but yet a clear division of them not arresting, not engaging in enforcement activities directly attributed to any illegal crossings of either aliens, narcotics, or, or things of that nature. We have experience in this. It has worked out very well. And uh, I can assure this group that the National Guard, the citizen soldiers, will bring us a tremendous amount of capability in securing the, our borders. OK, great. We'll go to the next question. The gentleman in the front row right here. I'll wait for a microphone, please. Thank you. Ruben Barrera with the Mexican News Agency, not in Mexico. This is a question for Secretary Napolitano. Madam Secretary, I wonder if you can expand about two of the announcements that you made regarding the deployment of new personnel to Arizona and also the use of these on main earth. I, I hear a vehicle in Texas. Uh, could you give us precise numbers? And uh, I wonder if, given the fail of the SBNet program so far, uh, if the U.S. government is considering the possibility to expand the use of this type of aero vehicle along the border with Mexico. The, uh, well, part of it depends on Congress passing uh, the supplemental that the President has requested, but uh, that supplemental uh, pays for 1,000 more Border Patrol agents, 160 more uh, ICE investigators, uh, 30 more port officers, 20 more canine teams, and, and two predators uh, to be used along the border. Uh, many of those, as well as some existing forces, are surging into Arizona, uh, and they, but they're doing it in a coordinated way. So uh, the numbers today may not be the same as the numbers next week or the numbers the week thereafter, and we, but we can get you uh, some numbers um, uh, after this program. Uh, uh, the goal is, of course, uh, to focus on the Tucson sector. Anybody that knows that border uh, knows that uh, we have uh, done a pretty good job of closing off uh, San Diego, Tijuana area and uh, the El Paso uh, area. Uh, but that has caused a lot of the drug trafficking organizations and human trafficking organizations to focus their roots uh, into Arizona along uh, that quarter. And our goal now is to shut that quarter down. Great, thank you. Let's try this side of the room over here, uh, back with the red dress in the corner.
For Secretary Napolitano, um, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has confirmed and other sources within the administration have confirmed that the administration will be filing a federal lawsuit against the state of Arizona. And I'm wondering, since you were governor of Arizona, spent so much time there, if you could comment on that. I'm sorry, could you state your name and where you're from, oh, too? Oh, sorry. Carolyn Pursuti with Voice of America TV. Um, uh, no. Um. <laughs> All right, can we go to the next no, question? No, no. <laughs> Listen, uh, uh, questions about uh, uh, whether, how, what, and, uh, uh, whether, how, when, or whatever to challenge uh, the Arizona law uh, should be addressed to the Department of Justice. Uh, what I'm here uh, saying today is that enforcement along this border in those border states is primarily a federal responsibility, uh, that we do that and need more manpower, more technology, more infrastructure to assist. That's part of our plan. Uh, we need to be working with Mexico. That's part of our plan. And we need to work with state and local law enforcement. That's part of our plan as well, uh, particularly when it comes to the organizations that are uh, exploiting that border for their own gain. No more questions for the side of the room. You guys are in the penalty box. Um, all right, we'll go back to the middle here. <laughs> uh, anybody questions in the middle? A gentleman in the front row? David Silverberg, Homeland Security Today magazine. Um, there have been reports of, uh, well, like shots exchanged and so forth with Mexican military forces along the border and of um, Mexican military forces uh, escorting drug uh, shipments and so forth. Uh, is there any, uh, what impact is that having on these initiatives and on U.S.-Mexican relations along the border uh, for the future? Why don't I take that and also ask uh, uh, Commissioner Aguilar also to, to uh, Deputy Commissioner Aguilar also to address that. Look, uh, as 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 noted, I've worked this border in this border area a long time. Uh, there are from time to time uh, reports, uh, uh, some verified, some unverified. It's awfully diff difficult out there uh, to attribute the identity of any particular group that. Is, is moving along along the border, um, uh, but uh, as individual incidents arise, uh, we deal with our Mexican counterparts uh, about that in an appropriate way. Um, uh, let me uh, say this, however, our uh, cooperation with and working on day-to-day -day working relationship with uh, Mexican federal law enforcement uh, has never uh, been stronger. Um, and, and as someone said uh, earlier today, part of it is about relationships and knowing uh, the people who have basically the equivalent of my job on, on the Mexican side of the boundary of the border. Uh, and uh, those relationships are very strong and that's why we believe that with these additional resources, with the strategy, the smart, effective tactics and strategy we've been employing, will be deploying, uh, and then working with Mexico, uh, that is our best chance to uh, finally get at these drug cartels that have, you know, played havoc with both countries for far too long. But Chief Aguilar, did you want to say anything about that? On the issue of uh, working with our Mexican partners and our neighbor, I can tell you that after 32 years of service, our relationship with Mexico overall has never been better whether it be with the military, with the SSP, with any other government agency that works with us. And that is what has brought us to where we are today. There has been a brighter delineation, if you will, of the border that did in the past cause some problems of inadvertent entries of the Mexican military into the U.S. and, frankly, us into Mexico also. But that brighter delineation by way of the infrastructure that we have uh, put in place, but more importantly, the collaborative effort that the Secretary spoke to just now where we collabor collaborate on the strategies, on the application of resources, on mirroring uh, efforts in order to bring greater control to that border. As far as to your question about shots exchanged, I can't remember the last time that that happened. I can tell you that it has happened in the past, again, when there was those inadvertent actions that did occur. But uh, I want to reinforce that our partnership with our Mexican partners has been just tremendous. And that is part of what is also getting us to better securing the border as we move forward. Okay, we'll go uh, to this side of the room over here. Um, okay, we're in the front row right here. And you guys are letting Assistant Secretary Morton off the hook. 
Uh, hi, Marisa Lino with uh, Northrop Grumman, but formerly with uh, Homeland Security International Affairs. I want to take a slightly different tack and ask uh, to the secretary or anyone, uh, when I read the title of Securing the Border, I know everyone assumes that the main topic is going to be the southern border, but with all due respect to His Excellency, the Ambassador of Mexico, we also have another neighbor. And I wonder if you might comment on how many of these new measures or different measures might be applied to the northern border. Let me, let me take that and, and, uh, uh, and say that the measures I've described today are for the southwest border. Um, however, we have other measures we've applied at, at the northern uh, border, uh, including uh, more deployment of uh, mobile type radar systems, uh, uh, more agents. We have met the congressional mandate for the number of agents that need to be at the northern uh, border. We have excellent cooperation, of course, with the RCMP. And we have an aggressive program underway now to uh, improve and provide better equipment and technology at the actual ports of entry all along the northern border. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. The, the, uh, the only other thing I would add is the following, that we don't forget about the northern border. Uh, as the Secretary pointed out, we're, co we're continually adding the, uh, the Border Patrol agents and ICE agents. We have the best teams. We have IBETs, and we work collectively with the, with the Canadians, with CBSA, RCMP. In addition to that, one of the areas that we're taking a look at now as we work progressively with them is taking a look at that border, not just as a juridical line, just, not just that line in the frozen tundra up there, but as it relates to flows, flows of people, flows of cargo, and flows of transportation modes. So that to every degree possible, we're looking at those flows literally from point of origin as it transits towards the United States, as it arrives at the United States at the entry point and then egress, to where we work collectively with foreign law enforcement, domestic law enforcement in partnership to ensure that we do everything possible, not just at the juridical line, but throughout those flows. And ICE plays a big part on that. Uh, I don't know if you want to expand on that, uh, Mr. Morton. Well, I, I'll just add that uh, first, with regard to the Canadian border, we do have three border enforcement security task forces. If the President's budget is approved um, as requested this year, you're going to see more. And, um, you know, that focuses exclusively on transnational crime coming across the border with Canada. But to, to pick up on the point that the Deputy Commissioner made, it's much more aggressive than that. Um, you know, when, when I come to work every day now, I think about the uh, border starting in our 44 offices overseas. Um, you know, London, Paris, uh, you know, our, our biggest uh, foreign office by a long shot is in Mexico City. We have uh, officers not only in Mexico City, but in cities throughout uh, Mexico. And we have uh, an extraordinary level of cooperation with the, our law enforcement uh, partners in those places, and it's because the idea of um, thinking about border security simply in terms of the line in the sand just, just is, is outdated. As the Deputy Commissioner said, it is all about flows, flows of a lot of things that we want to encourage, trade, lawful travel, and uh, flows that aren't so uh, helpful and lawful and that we need to uh, pay a lot of attention and, and try to shut them down. Chief Davis, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think, well, just one quick thing, and that is the fact that, again, we're talking about relationships. We've heard how they are working with our partners both in Canada and Mexico. Uh, we have seen that there's much better cooperation between ICE and local law enforcement officials because of the fact that they've recognized some of our needs uh, in terms of how we're working with our communities and trying to mitigate those issues that come up whenever you're talking about um, custom or, excuse me, uh, immigration enforcement. But I do think that the point simply needs to be made that, look, you're looking at a group of people here that have made a lot of strides and a lot of progress over the last several years. Nobody has been sitting around waiting for these problems to come at us. This hasn't just happened. All of these agencies have been very proactively involved. And, in fact, just one quick comment. I'm, we're very happy to have seen that the Department of Homeland Security is really focused on making sure that they are reaching out to local law enforcement. Uh, and I can prove that by the fact that we know the man at DHS on a first-name basis, Bart Johnson, who is working with us in this effort. So the point simply is if you're looking at us saying what are we doing to work together, well, local law enforcement right there trying to support what it is that they're doing as well. All right, thank you very much. We'll go back over to the side of the room. Uh, the gentleman over there. Uh, Chris Strom with Congress Daily. Uh, question for Secretary Napolitano. Um, as you know, 
uh, Republicans in Congress say they won't support comprehensive immigration reform until the border is secure. So with that, um, can you give a timeline on when the border will be secure, or do you think that that argument is just, or do you think that argument is political posturing and they keep moving the goalposts? Well, look, um, we think these resources we've asked for matter. Um, we think that they matter because uh, they will augment the efforts that have been underway uh, over, the, over the past years and accelerated uh, over the past uh, 18 months. Um, and uh, the plain fact of the matter is, is that uh, uh, the border is as secure now uh, as it's ever been, but uh, we know we can always do more. And, and that will always be the case. It's a big border. It's 1,960 miles uh, uh, across that southwest border. It's some of the roughest, toughest geographical terrain uh, in the world uh, across uh, that border. Um, and so the notion that you're going to seal that border somehow uh, is, uh, is something that anybody who's been involved in the actual doing of law enforcement, the front office work of, uh, the front line work of the law enforcement would say, you're never going to totally seal that border. Recognizing also that there's a lot of trade and commerce we want going back and forth. I mean, Mexico uh, for 22 of our states is our number one or two uh, trading partner. I mean, it's huge, the, the, the amount of commerce that goes back and forth. But uh, this will make our border even more secure. Uh, and we will keep evolving as indeed border threats keep evolving. Um, but uh, the notion that you're going to somehow seal the border and, and only at that point will you uh, discuss immigration reform, uh, that, that is not an answer to the problem. Okay, now, uh, next question. Uh, Arno, a colleague from CSIS. Thank you, Honorable Borgraf. Yes, I asked my question is for Mr. Morton. Uh, how does one calculate the daily average of deportations of illegal immigrants? Is it done on a daily or weekly or monthly basis? What is the average? And what is the cost per deportation? Uh, on any, uh, in any given year, about 380,000 uh, people, um, a little, little over uh, 1,000 a day. Um, and uh, we calculate that daily in some uh, offices, uh, actually by um, the shift. So it's a major uh, operation, um, and uh, obviously we keep very close track on it. Okay, great. This will be the, the last question. Um, I think it's time for the, uh, the middle of the room here. The gentleman in the front row, we'll, we'll give it to you. Is a, yeah, is a question for all of us? Well, we form it that way. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, in the next 24 months, uh, in terms of your priorities... Sorry, your uh, name and where you're from? Oh, I'm Mike Connors, Booz Allen Hamilton. In the next 24 months, uh, given your priorities and the fact that you've alluded to the dynamic nature of border security, uh, do we have the proper mix of people, process, and technology now with the changing nature of SBINet and other programs uh, where do we want to be in 24 months in terms of uh, Border Patrol personnel, uh, mobile radars, uh, uh, the whole system of, of border security, especially as threat compression occurs and you close off certain routes uh, and then the uh, narcotics traffickers come up with semi-submersibles, uh, uh, small airplanes and other types of means to circumvent our systems. Thank you. I think that is actually a pretty good question for, for all of us, given uh, all of our relevant experience. Um, uh, and uh, look, bo uh, border security uh, requires manpower, it requires technology, it requires infrastructure, uh, it requires um, uh, properly trained uh, law enforcement at, at all levels um, uh, who are working together. Um, it requires prioritization. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, we really want to focus on, uh, as John Morton said, for example, removal of uh, criminal aliens who pose a danger to the public safety of our uh, communities. 
Um, uh, and, you know, so setting those priorities and making sure that everybody out to the front lines understands those priorities is, is another part, uh, important part of the mix. Um, I believe that uh, uh, the, the measures that we have taken and are taking now to augment uh, our efforts uh, will, will uh, even further secure the land border uh, between the United States and Mexico. Um, but uh, uh, if, if, if you uh, look at our charter as the Department of Homeland Security, in addition to counterterrorism, which is always our, our number one priority, our next priority is securing our land borders, but also our air and our sea borders. And so uh, we are already seeing and, and, and dealing with drug traffickers going out to uh, the Pacific, uh, increasing their routes there, increasing Atlantic uh, traffic, uh, and the uh, ultralights uh, uh, trying to come across uh, the border. Uh, and we're already working on the strategy uh, and the technology necessary to shut that down, too. And, and we will not be satisfied, and I won't be satisfied, mm -hmm. till. Uh, those other routes are shut down as well as the land routes. Uh, Gil? Let me mention the other side of the coin. Uh, a little over four weeks ago, uh, President Obama released his national drug control strategy from the Oval Office. Twenty-four <coughs> months from now, what I'd like to see is Americans consuming less drugs. Uh, there are some ambitious goals in that. If we weren't such a huge consumer nation, as Secretary Clinton, Secretary Napolitano, and others have mentioned, we would be causing not only far less grief to people within our own borders, we would be causing far less grief to the people in Mexico. So, Secretary Borton, we'll just go down the row. A few things I think you'll see in um, the coming uh, few years from the perspective of ICE and process and technology, uh, one of the biggest is that we're in the process of transforming uh, immigration enforcement when it comes to criminal offenders. And I think if we were to reconvene in two years, we would be in a situation in which secure communities is in almost every uh, state and local prisoner jail and technology is allowing us to identify at the moment of arrest and booking who you're dealing with. Does the person have a criminal record? What is their immigration status? And uh, that is going to have an enormously profound effect on the way we go about our business. We are going to, for the first time in our nation's history, um, be able to get a, a full handle on uh, criminal offenders who are not here lawfully. Uh, we're already well underway with that, and, and it works. Um, and, and it avoids um, some of the concerns in the past about uh, profiling and um, targeted enforcement. Uh, the beauty of secure communities is every single pe person gets their fingerprints run. I'd get my fingerprints run, you'd get your fingerprints run. Um, and the fingerprints uh, don't lie. Well, Deputy Commissioner Aguilar? I, I think it's it's important to bring some a little bit of clarity to border security. Border security is about illegal immigration. It's about narcotics. It's about weapons, illegal. It's about illegal funds. And very importantly, it is about <laughs> criminal organizations that are operating at our borders and, and between our borders. That's the first thing. We have done a lot and need to continue doing a lot, as the Secretary is pushing and is saying, with personnel, tactical infrastructure, and technology. The one thing that I would add that I think all of us would appreciate is not only that balance of personnel, technology, and infrastructure, but also the balance of how we approach the border and making sure that we meld our investigative functions with our interdictive functions on intelligence basis. It is by melding those capabilities and those functions that we're going to bring the, the greatest force enhancement to this border. And then going back to one other issue that, uh, that uh, I think is critical is technology. Technology, there are, there are basically three ways to add to the border. There is a systems approach, which takes long. All of us are aware with uh, what's happening with SBI Net and, uh, frankly, the disappointments with SBI Net. So there's a systems approach. There's off the shelf, and there's evolving. It is a combination of all three of those that we need to approach in the right fashion that will get us to where we need to go. So from a priority standpoint, it's the personnel, the tactical infrastructure, and the technology by way of the three, uh, three areas that I talked about. 
and then it is melding the interdiction, the investigative, and the intelligence functions that we can bring to bear in a collective fashion domestically and with our foreign partners. And the last word to our distinguished guest from California. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'll begin quickly by saying what we want to see and then what we don't want to see. Uh, clearly what we would like to see in terms of local law enforcement, and specifically for the major city chiefs, again, these are the largest cities in the country, we do need to see comprehensive immigration and reform uh, coming from a federal re response. I mean, very, very clearly the Secretary was clear when she mentioned it earlier, if we end up with 50 separate state laws on how it is that local law enforcement is supposed to be helping in this effort, we're going to have a huge problem. Again, keep in mind, local law enforcement across this country is getting squeezed. I've mentioned that we're the 10th largest city in the country. We're talking about cutting our patrol forces by 8% by August. What, are, what do you, as local community members, want your local law enforcement police department to be doing? Do you want us focusing on the robberies and the sexual assaults and the domestic violence and the burglaries and the traffic accidents? Or do you want us to start shunting a lot of our resources to handling federal civil violations? Remember, these immigration violations are civil in nature. Local law enforcement has a responsibility of providing for a criminal response. So what we don't want to see is we don't want to see local law enforcement agencies being required to enforce immigration laws. Clearly, each local law enforcement agency and their local communities need to decide what is best for them. We're not saying that there aren't problems. We clearly hear the frustrations when it's coming from across the country. And we've even heard frustrations from, sh from some sheriffs and others on the local border states. But understand that we can't put our local law enforcement in a position where all of a sudden we are shunting our very precious resources to deal with this issue. It's a federal issue. We're happy to help however we can, but it should not be the primary focus of local law enforcement to enforce immigration laws. One of the last point on this is it's really beginning to hamper our community policing relationships. We've spent decades in local law enforcement trying to establish relationships with all of our different minority communities. San Jose, there are over a million people in San Jose. There is not a majority of anything. 32% of our population is Hispanic, 20% is Asian. We've done great things to try and get inroads with these communities, and they don't always understand, because of language barriers and other things, what's taking place with this, with this topic or this issue. But local law enforcement is the one that they look to, and they're fearful of us if we're coming into neighborhoods to respond to calls because they think somehow we're trying to do other things. Be very clear. Local law enforcement will be the first ones to step up if there is a criminal issue going on. If ICE comes in and says, we're looking for a homicide suspect, he's an illegal immigrant, whatever the case may be, local law enforcement across this country will step up and, and help. But do we want our local law enforcement agencies to be the primary focus of this enforcement on civil laws? And I'm telling you, with the resources and the budgets, et cetera, it, and the community policing issues, it's just not the way to go. So we need to see the federal response. That's what we'd like to see within 24 months. But we clearly do not want to see 50 different state laws telling how, local law enforcement how it is that they're going to be going out there to solve this problem. It is a no-win situation for local law enforcement. Secretary Balotano, you wanted to well, I, I just wanted to, to offer a friendly amendment uh, 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 for the chief, um, uh, and, and that is Congress Congress has seen fit to describe uh, initial uh, uh, entries as, as misdemeanors, uh, and so it's a you know it's a minor offense, and 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 the, but the calculus is the same. Do you want local law enforcement spending their time? Uh, mandated to spend their time on those as opposed to the homicide, rape, ag assault, and at the expense of very extensive commuting, uh, community uh, policing efforts that uh, are created to uh, supply the public safety architecture uh, for, for communities. I just, I just wanted to clarify that one point. Well, before we thank our guests, it's going to be imperative that it remains seated until uh, Secretary DePolitano and our party leave. But uh, we'd like to thank you all very much for your time. We realize you're very busy. We appreciate your comments. <laughs>